Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sanjeev Verma, and I'm chairman and co-founder of Prevail, an end-to-end -end encrypted email and file sharing system to help simplify CMMC, ITAR, and NIST 800-171 compliance. A very warm welcome to our guests and to the participants in today's webinar. So there are two pressing questions on the minds of the attendees in the defense industrial base, uh, especially those of you that are small to medium defense contractors. The first question is, when do I need to act on DOD's upcoming CMMC and I underscore existing NIST 800-171 DFARS regulations? When do I act? And the second question is, how can I ensure compliance with these complex regulatory environments and requirements in a simple and cost-effective manner? So the purpose of today's webinar is simply to have a panel of industry and compliance experts provide you with important information to answer just those two questions. So as this agenda is showing, we will start with important updates that have recently come out on the CMMC program and its timeline and DFARS regulations and its timelines. And to present those will be Mr. Reagan Edens. He's the chief compliance officer for DTC Global. It's an organization that provides authoritative compliance consulting to prepare large defense contractors and suppliers to meet DOD regulations. Well, all that is nice, but what makes Reagan, without doubt, one of the absolute top authorities on CMMC and NIST 800-171 is that he was the founding director for CMMC AB's uh, accreditation body, the CMMC AB, now called, uh, I guess it's called the Cyber AB. That's right. And uh, he was, more importantly, the chairman of the Standards Management Committee, these the committee that set the standards for compliance. And I would not be remiss in saying that there are few in industry that can rival Reagan's expertise in CMMC and NIST 800-171 compliance. So we're gonna start with that. So that's the when. Then we move on to the why. And in order to simplify NIST, and CMMC, most organizations will need to rely on a cloud platform. And for that, it must have impeccable foundations in compliance. And so we're gonna introduce you to Amazon Web Services GovCloud you know, platform. And to do, do the honors, we have with us Ted Stefan, who's the lead for all federal compliance acceleration at Amazon worldwide for the public sector. And again, I have just one sentence to describe uh, Ted's expertise, and that is that he led Amazon's efforts to get AWS GovCloud itself get certified for a FedRAMP ATO so that government agencies can use it to store you know, sensitive information. So following that, you know, AWS is a foundation platform. A CMMC is all about protecting CUI and CUIs in the form of emails and files. And there needs to be also precise documentation to comply with CMMC. And so I, uh, representing Prevail, will provide you with an understanding of the Prevail's end-to-end -end encrypted email and file sharing platform and how we comply, help you comply with about 84 out of the 110 compliance requirements. And then after that, we move along in the journey. You've established yourself on a solid platform. You've got ways to protect your CUI but you also need a platform to organize your documents. There is a mountain of documents, you know, 300, 400 pages of them, and you need something to organize your documents. You need to submit your security scores to the SPRS system. And while you could patch all these things together, say in an Excel spreadsheet, keeping track of them would be an enormously difficult challenge. So what you need is a governance risk and compliance platform to help you keep track of them, to report your SPRS. And so Matt Majot from ComplyApp, which is an excellent fully encrypted GRC platform on AWS, will show you in about 10 minutes or so 
how you can organize your documentation, how you can compute your SPRS scores, et cetera. So now you're a substantive way through to your compliance journey, but I wanna emphasize, and I'll say this again, you're still not there. What we wanna underscore is that these undertakings, while ComplyUp and AWS and Prevail help you go a long ways further, still needs to be stitched together and we'll go back to Reagan. And what Reagan will do is to say how you can bring a compliance expert to address remaining gaps, how you can stitch together a compliance program so that you are finally ready for an external audit, either through a certified third-party assessment organization or a C3PA or a DIB or even a DIB audit. So um, that's the format that we are gonna be following. And so we'll, through this brief hour, walk you through a complete cycle from start of having known almost nothing about compliance to knowing something about compliance, knowing what to do about it, and at the end being ready for CMMC and ASTA 171. And so with that, I now hand it over to uh, Reagan Edens to kick it off by sharing with us what are the important updates on CMMC and ASTA 800 and DFARS that have come up uh, recently. Next slide. Uh yeah, thanks, Sanjeev. Um, and it's always a pleasure to be on target and on time with so many esteemed colleagues. And of course, you as well. It's been a great uh, and adventurous journey uh, over the past several years with CMMC and DFARS requirements. So let's skip to it. We've got a lot in the hopper, folks. Uh, we've got some um, uh, really strong progress as we transition from the DFAR 7012, the current requirements now, into the CMMC uh, program. Uh, the voluntary uh, certification period is beginning to start at the end of this month. And I am very fortunate enough to say that DTC Global has uh, one of the uh, two of the four, or one of the four uh, companies in, uh, ready on the 29th to be certified or to go through the assessment, knock on wood, and to, and to get certified. So we're very fortunate to have uh, provided them with our documentation and, and, the, and their opportunity to work very hard over the last year to prepare for that assessment. So those assessments are going very full bore, and they're walking hand-in-hand -hand with DIPCAC and walking hand-in-hand -hand with the brand-new certified C3PAOs. So that's, a, that's an exciting time for those organizations out there that have um, their, their ducks in a row and are ready to really move forward and get the certification completed. Now, we've also got some other important things like the five-day notice audits with DOD. Those are moving forward. Um, and so the DOD is notifying people and, and asking uh, within five days to return back for them to provide their evidence to support uh, their supplier performance risk score, SPRS score. And so those organizations that are ready and able to provide that documentation are certainly, um, are certainly looking forward to that. But many organizations out there, the numbers and the assessment from the DIPCAC is that um, there are real challenges out there with organiz um, organizations understanding their requirements, having the proper documentation and evidence, and being prepared to substantiate their SPS scores. So it's very important that you pay attention to the details that we talk about because that's happening in real time as we speak um, in August and in September. We also have the updated D uh, DOD program, uh, POAM guidance. So that plan of action and milestones right now has a sort of an unlimited bandwidth and many organizations haven't have been had a difficult time moving forward and getting those things knocked out and completing their POAM items. There's an expectation that the plan of action milestones will be limited and that there will be uh, uh, many items on there that will not be allowed on the POAM at all. So those items will have to be met and what circumstances or what the details of that we don't yet know. But I would, uh, I would tell you that there is a sense of urgency because the DOD could easily say, look, folks, um, you have 30 days to be compliant and to remove those things off of, your, off of your POAM, or you have 60 days, or you have 90 days, or worse, you have no time at all because of the uh, deadline being thir December 31st of 2017. So that's an important warning that uh, folks need to uh, pay attention to because what will likely happen is whatever the circumstances are that the DOD requires in, in relationship to that updated policy, you can expect the, the um, prime contractors to ping 
the rest of their supply chain in order to um, comply with that updated policy. Last but not least, we've got the interim rule for 7019 and 7020, which are principally the SPRS rules. Those are going to go into a final rule expected in the end of November. And we also expect the release of the interim rule in either December or March at the very latest. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Sanjeev. So I want to actually go back to you, Reagan. I want to summarize yes. a few things over here. Sure. So the first thing is that you've educated us in the past that, look, if you are a contractor, you are under current DFAS requirements required to implement NIST 800-171 controls, and that is for That's those right. that handle CUI. Right. And so that rule is in effect, it's gonna become permanent for you to go and report your scores. So first thing is that you are required under current regulations to go and implement NIST 800-171, and right. under DFAR 7019 and 7020, you got to go and report your SPR scores. That's an interim rule. And that rule becomes finalized in December. And failure to either report those scores or inaccurately report those scores has consequences that businesses will not wish to face. I want um, to first underscore that and uh, get your comments on that. Yeah, so so there, there are... I, you know, I, I'm not really about scare tactics, and and there is a sense of genuine urgency here because what we're happening, what we see happening anecdotally across of our clients and across the organizations that that we work closely with within the ecosystem, we see a couple things. One thing is that the prime contractors are now getting more sophisticated, and they're asking smarter and harder questions to answer, which is, what is your SPRS score? And do you have evidence to substantiate that score? Because remember, the evidentiary requirements and the documentation requirements that we'll talk about today are absolutely critical to justifying your SPRS score as it is. It's the same evidentiary standard. So as we move forward from, from the DFARS requirements that have been in, in, in existence since uh, December 31st of 2017 at that deadline, all the way up till now, underneath the requirements of 7019 and 7020 to report your SBR score and, and provide evidence of that score is going to be consistent with the requirements underneath the 7021, which requires you to be certified. So as we see forward in, in um, across the, the DIB, many companies are being uh, barred from uh, uh, submitting proposals in response to requirements. Uh, many companies are being asked to limit their participation in whatever capacity is appropriate because they don't have the right score or they don't have the right um, substantiation of the documentation. So we see real intangible impacts that is happening right now across the dip. And, and quite honestly, that is appropriate because what we don't want to do is we don't want the, the uh, prime contractors to be blind or or to avoid enforcement of the requirements and then everything windfall at once. What's absolutely necessary is that the prime contractors, which they have move forward, begin to uh, um, mature their understanding and the enforcement of their requirements and then, um, and then reach down through their supply chain, not just their tier one or tier two uh, contractors, but their sub tier contractors as well, because they are certainly responsible for all of them according to DOD policy. So the reality is, is it's not just the tier top tier contractors, but you're talking about third, fourth, fifth, seventh, eighth, 27th tier, all the way down that are being impacted by these requirements right, right now in their limitations to participate or their limitations in ability to bid. So Reagan, I go, I go back to, um, you're the compliance expert and you live, breathe and speak you know, 19, 20, DFARS 21, and so forth. Many right. of our participants are small to medium businesses and defense right. contractors. And I want us to simplify it for them. So sure. on their minds, we often hear, it's a simple question. Okay, DFAR 70, 19, 20 is in effect. You say mm -hmm. it's becoming a final rule. CMMC okay. is an interim rule. That's the current projection in March of 2023. So I interpret that as, I got time, you know, I'll deal with it sometime next year. Would you think that that will be an appropriate conclusion? And if so, if not, why? 
Well, hey, number one is remember that this, Sanjeev, isn't about compliance, really. This is really about protecting the national security interest, right? There's inherent sacred duty and obligation for organizations to assume the responsibility and to protect the data that's entrusted to them and the data that they create in performance of the contract. So I'm not a compliance guy, really, throughout my entire career. I've, it's always been about the mission. And in my mind, our mission is to be able to get companies um, to understand the requirements, to be able to navigate the requirements, seek appropriate and authoritative sources for guidance that they can rely on, and to meet the requirements so that they can, A, secure the data, and B, really focus on the product and services that they do. So the reality for all of us is this, is that there are real negative consequences that are coming, and they're coming very rapidly. In six months or 12 months from now, there's going to be a stark difference between those organizations that are compliant and those organizations aren't that aren't. It takes genuinely, it takes a quite a while for to mobilize an organization to move through the requirements, to implement those requirements, and to prepare all the, the appropriate documentation, and then and then and then begin to accumulate the evidence which demonstrates the fact that you actually have implemented the, the requirements correctly, they're operating as intended, and they're producing the desired outcome, which is to um, protect the CUI. That evidence is absolutely critical to the national security interest. It's 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 uh, critical to demonstrating the fact that you actually do these uh, compliance requirements and not just meet them. Remember, it's about sustaining them. So to mobilize an organization, whether they're very big or very long or very small, it really does take easily easily six months and and quite and quite honestly, in order for an organization to hit its stride, it's twelve plus months. Now, what I've seen is this. I've seen those organizations that are vigilant um, actually create enormous windfalls and competitive advantage for them against their competitors. I've seen 40 to 60% top line revenue growth, and I'm sure everyone in the audience understands that. 40 to 60% 60 top line revenue growth amongst my clients alone, that I can personally attest to that, as they not just meet requirements, but they turn back to their parent organizations or to their DOD contracting officers and say, look, we not only meet these requirements, we fully understand them, and we will demonstrate to you how we actually meet these requirements and show you how we protect your data. That differentiates those organizations who really do have a strong hand in, um, and an understanding of this separately from their peer organizations that are either hiding or avoiding these requirements. And we've seen um, significant opportunities come to those organizations which are willing to step forward and, and really be out front and honest and, and really lead the opportunity, despite the fact that it's four years after the deadline. So I think in conclusion, if I could summarize, you know, the notion of providing an SPRS score is very significant because it's an objective metric that both the DOD and the primes can look at to evaluate your level of cybersecurity. So First thing is that you need to be prepared to, you know, have the controls in place, mechanisms in place to, you know, calculate your SPRS score. And it's a single number that's going to dictate to a prime and to the DOD how good you are. So that's one. The second point that I want to underscore over here is that we started this webinar with a question of when do I need to act? And you made uh, very much the case through your compliance uh, expertise and experience that for typical organizations, it takes about six to you know, months and, and beyond to get prepared. And given that these rules are you know, getting into final stage for December, 2022, and for CMMC March, 2023, uh, perhaps you know, this is about as late as you wanna get started if that's what you wanna do on the journey. So I think um, with that, um, having established that, I now wanna move over to the how. So let's say that you know you are an organization that now says, look, I need to do something about it for the reasons that were articulated. How do I go about it? So the first thing is that as Reagan had articulated, it's all about protecting the CUI. And existing basic platforms for emails and files and other ways that you have CUI and data you know, don't generally meet your basic Office 365 or your basic you know, G Suite or Dropbox won't do it. So you need a platform that you know, is both secure and compliant, 
And that foundational platform is, uh, or one of the two leading ones is AWS Gov Cloud. And to share with you the platform, its capabilities, uh, I'd like to hand it over to Ted Stephan. Thank you, Sanjeev. Let me bring up my screen. All right. Uh, you should be able to see my screen now. Um, thanks again. Um, uh, Reagan, tough act to follow there. Your uh, uh, energy is awesome in this space. Uh, so as, as Sanjeev mentioned earlier, um, I'm Ted Steffen. Uh, I'm the lead for compliance acceleration um, within our government regions uh, group. Um, and, and so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about uh, GovCloud and how, how you can operate and run secure workloads there. Um, there we go. So um, AWS is a, a large global infrastructure. We've got 26 regions throughout the, the world, um, 84 individual availability zones. Um, and, and amongst all of that, we've got this, this notion of what we call AWS GovCloud. And we've got a West region um, as well as an East region. And, and those regions are um, completely isolated from the rest of the network. Um, the rest of the AWS infrastructure. Um, and, and we do that for a, a variety of reasons. Um, you know, it's a, a community cloud. We, we vet each and every account holder in there. Um, we, we have connectivity to the DoD cloud access points um, for DoD usage, as well as partners that are building solutions on AWS. Uh, we do manage AWS US Gov Cloud um, with citizens, US citizens on US soil. Um, and, and, and we do that to meet uh, a handful of requirements, uh, uh, notionally uh, DOD impact level five. Um, there's some uh, other uh, controlled and classified workloads that, that have that US citizen requirement as well. Um, so we manage the entire um, US um, Gov Cloud infrastructure with US citizens. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, it is a completely isolated um, uh, environment from our other regions. Uh, all of the, the the data and the network and, and machines are isolated. Um, the uh, uh, accounts in that are uh, in, in GoCloud are isolated and separate from the account that you would have in the rest of the global infrastructure. Um, if you are an AWS user, you'll understand that um, the IAM account that you have in, say, our commercial region, US East, um, you can use that same account globally um, without having to, uh, you know, create a new account for maybe the uh, the UK region or the Canadian region. Um, but with GovCloud, that's different. You 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 must have a separate account there. That's that's how we're controlling our access to the region um, and 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 maintaining that isolation. Um, and and in order to to pull all of this together. Um, we have to have a, a separate dedicated management console specific for GovCloud. Um, and and that's, that will have to do with, um, you know, the services that are available there, um, how you, who gets access to them and, and how you configure them. Um, and so let's talk about what, what does it take to get access to AWS GovCloud US? Um, so the, the root account holder must be a U.S. person, and, and that's defined by the, the Census Bureau um, as either a U.S. citizen um, or a green card holder. Uh, so those are the, the, the re, you know, the person requirements as far as uh, gaining an account in GovCloud. Um, the organization must be a U.S. entity um, and must be incorporated to do business in the United States and be based on U.S. soil. Um, it can also, it should also not, or it, it cannot be on the ITAR barred list. Um, so uh, if an organization gets put on that list being barred from handling or um, uh, working with uh, ITAR data, uh, we cannot allow them to have an access or an account in GovCloud. Um, and, and with all of the protections that we have in place, we have GovCloud set up in a way that uh, handles export controlled data and, and, and we do that all day long. Um, uh, and, and so Sanjeev and, and Regan also mentioned, uh, you know, compliance. One of the things that, uh, you know, we're really good at with GovCloud is, is, you know, maintaining a very, you know, various certifications. This is a small handful of them. Um, you know, ITAR obviously kind of what we're talking about here today, um, FedRAMP High, 
uh, DOD IL-4 and 5, um, CGIS information, um, NIST 800-53 um, and 800-171, uh, DFARS, uh, FIPS for um, cryptography requirements, uh, as well as IRS data. And, and like I mentioned, these are these are just a small handful of the various types of, of uh, certifications that, that we meet um, with GovCloud. So with the GovCloud, um, you know, uh, it, we have a, a, a very, very strong catalog of services that are available in the region. Um, uh, recent count has that up to 133 individual services that that operate in the GovCloud region. Um, and to attest to um, the, the usage of that, um, we've got 139 individual federal agencies um, that have granted uh, a FedRAMP ATO at at least the moderate impact level in GovCloud. Um, and, and our partners um, are, are really leaning forward with, with what they're doing in GovCloud as well. I don't have the, the bullet listed on here, uh, but the, the last check, I've got 93 different SaaS or PaaS providers that have achieved a FedRAMP ATO running on top of AWS. Um, uh, and, and from a, uh, a DOD perspective, you know, we're still working through the uh, authorization process for some of the uh, services out of that 133 um, to get them to aisle four and five. But um, um, as of now, we have 99. A couple different resources that are available, um, you know, the, the various services that are in region, um, our services in scope page, which is a, a great resource if you're trying to figure out if a particular service has been authorized through a, um, a, a specific uh, compliance regime. Um, and, and this is all, you know, data that, you know, you can pull yourself, the services in scope is public. Um, if you want to look at how the, the federal government is leveraging uh, both U.S. East-West, our commercial region, as well as GovCloud, um, that's all available in, in Marketplace. Um, and, and you can see 544 individual authorizations um, for GovCloud by uh, federal agencies and departments within the agencies, and, and 451 in our commercial region, um, all at, at, at least at the moderate impact level. So how do we do this? Um, you know, security and 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 responsibilities are shared amongst what we do at AWS and, and what our customers are responsible for. Um, and and Sanjeev and and um, Matt and Reagan are going to talk a little bit more about this. But um, from an AWS perspective, we handle you know primarily security of the cloud, um, where our customers are responsible for handling security within the cloud. Um, and, and to help with that, we have a great amount of inheritance that's available for you. So um, out of the NIST 853 control family catalog, there are the primarily three families that you can um, fully inherit from us, the, the media protection family, um, the maintenance family, and, and of course, the physical and environmental. Um, there's some additional contingency planning that you get to um, inherit from us. Um, as well as some that are, are shared between um, our customers and AWS. And, and so it's GovCloud is, is really fit for any of the uh, controlled and classified information types that may be out there. We have um, customers that are using GovCloud for all of the various categories of CUI, uh, the small list of, of you know, um, uh, the various types on the screen here, um, but this is just a subset. It would be, uh, the, the screen would be completely full of the various uh, CU, CUI types that our customers are storing, processing, and transmitting via GovCloud. And with that, I appreciate your time, and I'm going to turn it back to Sanjeev. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> so, Ted articulated for us, the foundation platform of AWS GovCloud. And the key points that I want to underscore is that it has impeccable um, compliance credentials. Um, Ted made those points amply clear. But he also articulated that, look, we are providing you with a secure cloud. It's your responsibility to secure your CUI in the cloud. And so built on top of AWS GovCloud are 
a system that we provide at Prevail, which is handling the simple storage, sharing, transmission of your CUI in the form of emails and files. Because if you're a small business or a large business, CUI for you is generally speaking, it's files, it's emails that you're seeing, it's communication. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how the Prevail system, which is built on top of AWS GovCloud, basically makes AWS GovCloud completely transparent to you. You don't need to know, uh, you know much or anything about it. And you inherit the compliance controls through us that AWS GovCloud provides. So what is Prevail? Uh, if you are an SMB, you've got Office 365 or your basic exchange or your basic G Suite. Uh, you want to send an email that has CUI, or you've got a file in OneDrive or Google Drive or Dropbox uh, and folders that you want to share. You can't do that in a compliant fashion. So what Prevail basically says is keep those systems and add to them Prevail, which is something that you could do in a short matter of uh, typically an hour or so for an SMB. And what you get are two things. One is Prevail Drive, which is a document collaboration system. You can store and share, think your files, whether it's on PCs, Macs, uh, on your mobiles, and it operates much like you operate your OneDrive. And this is where you put your CUI, it's stored on, on GovCloud, shared on GovCloud, et cetera. And then you have in your existing email client, whether it's Outlook or Gmail with your existing email address, uh, a Prevail email system that allows you to have encrypted emails that can contain CUI. So I'm not gonna give you uh, the entire you know, uh, demo of the Prevail system, we're happy to do so separately, but I wanna outline a few key points about uh, why the system is helpful to you in uh, getting compliant. So first and foremost, the system uses end-to-end uh, -end encryption. I promise you this is the only tech Thing that I'll be sharing with you today, so that all of your CUI is encrypted automatically by you as a sender, stays encrypted on GovCloud in a manner in which Prevail or AWS cannot look at it, neither can the attacker, and can only be decrypted by the recipient. So it's a very powerful system to do that. And in addition to the fact that you can never decrypt it on AWS GovCloud, nor can Prevail decrypt it, you also get protections such that admins that handle your accounts, even if they are hacked, information is secure. If passwords are compromised, information is secure. And the system basically is very helpful for NIST 800, 171, CMMC and ITAR, um, obviously for HIPAA, PII, et cetera. And what reduces the cost and complexity for an SMB is that you can basically with your existing system, you don't have to get rid of it, you keep your old 365, your G Suite, just add it. And now you've got an ability to store, share your CUI within you know, the same systems that you're used to. And as I mentioned, you folks are using them on PCs and Macs and mobiles and, um, and oftentimes in Linux. And those are sort of uh, platforms that we support. So how good is the system for compliance? How many of the controls do we help comply? Well, the first thing is that an SMB um, using Prevail was audited by DIBCAC, which is the DOD Cybersecurity Assessment Center. And we're proud to say that they achieved 110 out of 110, which doesn't mean that, you know, just the use of Prevail alone got them to 110. Prevail in conjunction with you, the customer, addresses about 84 out of the 110 controls. And what's important about it is that that's a substantial majority, but also uh, that there is proven efficacy of the solution. As I mentioned, it's on, on GovCloud and there are additional requirements that are imposed uh, such as FedRAMP baseline moderate equivalency, the use of FIPS 140-2 validated encryption. And as the new uh, you know, cap has reiterated, you also need to be complying with DFAR 7012 C through G for incident reporting. Now, these are a mouthful for most of you, but you can essentially be assured that the platform 
uh, Prevail will be addressing those because you'll inherit compliance for those via us. Just to give you a sense for what's the foundational security of the system. So in a system like Prevail, when you send an email or you put a file in Prevail Drive, it automatically gets encrypted right on the device stays encrypted on the servers on GovCloud and can only be decrypted by the recipient. I underscore neither AWS nor Prevail can decrypt those, which is really the reason why uh, end-to-end -end encryption is a foundational security uh, mechanism advocated by the NSA. It's also the reason why state departments, new regulations now allow you to store share ITAR data in a properly configured end-to-end uh, -end encrypted system. So the foundation platform is one thing, but compliance as Reagan articulated is all about documentation. And documentation will take hundreds of hours to develop. And so what Prevail does is in addition to the platform, we provide you about a 200 plus page compliance documentation set that clearly specifies how you inherit the controls, why you inherit them from us, articulates for each control if you fully inherit the control from us or there's a shared responsibility for you to take care of some aspects of it. And so you get that documentation package. And this again is a big cost savings. And in one fell swoop by adopting the documentation and the platform, which is something that you can do in a matter of typically hours with perhaps a little bit of planning, uh, you are in an excellent stead in terms of your compliance. And so now you've got the system, but you now also want to show the auditors, look, I comply with these uh, controls. Here's my documentation for it. Here's the part that I have not complied and therefore have a poem for it. And for that, you need a GRC system. Uh, Reagan also articulated that you need to calculate your SPRS score and send it to uh, the SPRS in a database. Now you can do it all by yourself, or sort of like TurboTax that does all this for you automatically and simplifies it, a good GRC platform does this. And so now to show you the next part, which is you've implemented the basics, you got the documentation, now you wanna go and you know, organize it all together and create your system security plan first and SPRS score second. I'm gonna introduce you to the Comply Up platform and Matt's gonna show you how that next step gets you towards a point where you are substantively, but nowhere fully ready for compliance. So over to you, Matt. Hey, thanks so much, Angie. Uh, it's really cool to be here with, uh, you know, AWS and Prevail and Reagan agents. I mean, this is a big deal for us. So, hey, um, I'm gonna jump right in. I'm gonna share my screen. And my name is Matthew Majad. I'm the uh, sales director here at ComplyUp. And I want to show you uh, a bit of what Compliant can offer, as well as I want to show you what the partnership of the inherited uh, requirements and controls from Prevail look like inside the platform. So uh, I'm showing you right now the account dashboard. So we're looking at a CMMC level two assessment. I'm going to hit launch and we are encrypted fully in the user's browser. So we couldn't see your information if we wanted to. When you build an assessment with us, you actually generate an, a, an encryption passphrase that we can't replicate, we can't reproduce, we, we cannot, we can't see it in any way, shape, or form. So we're going to hit launch, and that's going to take us to the dashboard. So we're looking at a CMMC level two assessment here. Uh, this is a blank assessment, so you know we have zero assessment progress right now. Um, you know, there's there's not much in the practices and tasks graph. And you know, I really want to point out that you're starting at a negative 200 in proof. It doesn't mean that's exactly what your score is. It just means you're starting an assessment from scratch and you're starting at negative 200 in proof. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to show you what the prevail inheritance will do for you in terms of your SPRS score and what those requirements will look like for you. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to jump right into uh, what a what a requirement looks like in ComplyUp and what that workflow kind of looks like. So, but we we picked the first one, ac.l1-3.1.1. Uh, the platform is going to show you the domain, the practice ID, and then the practice description. So this is what it's actually telling us to do, right? It's saying, you know, limit information system access to authorize you. 
Uh, if you scroll down, you're going to see a lot of official guidance down below. This is pulled from the CMMC appendixes, some from the NIST handbooks, but we've got some discussion, uh, guidance around this requirement, examples, um, handbook questions, assessment considerations, and then big one, assessment objectives. So we're going to list, you know, a good bit of guidance down below. But, you know, ultimately what we want to do is we want to look at this requirement and say, okay, are we implemented? Are we not implemented? You know, what, what are we? So once we understand the requirement, we can say, hey, look, we're implemented or we're partially implemented. Uh, you know, it doesn't apply, it's inherited or it's not implemented. If it's partially implemented or not implemented, then the software wants you to create a plan of action. Uh, if it's implemented, then you can give your practice details here. And what we're doing is we're killing two birds with one stone. We're storing our assessment details in an encrypted repository that your whole team can access, right? That's one bird. The other bird that we're killing is we're actually literally creating our documentation right now. Um, there's a place to upload evidence and drop that in to associate to this particular requirement. And that's kind of what the workflow looks like. Um, you know, again, I want to kind of reiterate that we're starting at a score of negative 203. And now I want to show you what importing the prevail file will do for us. So prevail it has been a great partner. We've, we've kind of collaborated and they've said, look, we're going to give you our documentation. And so I'm actually importing uh, a prevail inheritance file. So in a matter of literal seconds, you can see exact, you can have clear visibility into exactly what prevail is taking care of for you. Uh, so I drop that file in, it's going to say assessment data import successful, and we'll just jump right back to the dashboard. And boom, I mean, you can immediately see the thing has come to life. You know, we're 65.2% through the assessment now. You know, we've got some graphs to look at for our practices and our tasks. Um, and the really big point here is the SPRS score. You're starting with a baseline of 40 uh, for your SPRS score with an inherited prevail assessment. So we went from negative 203 to 40 by simply utilizing what Prevail is doing for us. Uh, and now we can clearly see what Prevail has done in terms of you know, looking at all 110 and what's left, right? So there's some that are still in progress and we can clearly sort those out and say, okay, here's the extra 26 requirements that I'm gonna have to do some input on, right? Um, and then you can, you, know, you can jump right into one of the requirements to see exactly what Prevail has done to our workflow. You know, we can immediately, we can see that the requirement is implemented and it's inherited from Prevail. So they've gone ahead and they've, you know, immediately you can see that the practice implementation details are available. And this is actually going to show up in your system security plan. I mean, whatever you type in there, whatever you're clicking over on implementation status, all of that is building your documentation. Uh, you know, we can sort through the practices and see exactly how they've helped us, you know, what that what that solution has done for us. We now have clear visibility into that. Uh, so at any point in your assessment, at the beginning of it, in the middle of it, at the end of it, and then throughout the years, right, as you go through quarterly or however you want to do it, you can come to the documentation page and produce documentation. It's going to pull all that information from the platform, plug it into a system security plan and spit it out. Uh, so we can create a major or a minor revision you know, if we're making a major revision or a minor revision, we want to give it some details. This is going to help to create uh, a paper trail, right? When we have a C3PO come in and give us an assessment, it's actually going to, it's going to show all this revision history and say, look, here's the first one I ever created. It's a draft. It's a mess. Uh, here's the, the most recent one I've created, and it's beautiful. It's done. I'm 110. We're great. Uh, and this is what the, the document looks like. You know, it's going to download locally uh, as a Word file. And a lot of cool things happen with the encryption, right? It's actually decrypting a lot of information in your browser and plugging it into a system security plan template on your end of things. So we don't even ever store a filled out system security plan uh, in AWS GovCloud where we host. So uh, if we scroll down through some of this filler information, we're gonna get down to the meat and potatoes, uh, which is the, the practices. So we get into each individual practice. And here we can see in the system security plan, the, the practice ID, the name, and then our, our status around it, right? This is implemented and inherited from Prevail. And then you can find your implementation details listed there. So it takes what Prevail is doing and it, and it plugs it into that system security plan at your fingers whenever you want.
And then there's some other documentation you can produce. We can also produce a NIST 800-171 specific system security plan based off of the same CMMC assessment. Uh, we can pull out our evidence list in an Excel file. We can pull out our POAMs so we can start to sort through those and knock those out. Uh, practice details. And then finally, a breakdown of our SPRF score. You know, why do we have the score that we have? What are we missing? How do we get to that 110? So that, in, in a nutshell, that's kind of how the platform works. Um, you know, so what, what are we saying here? We're saying, what are we offering? We're saying, okay, AWS GovCloud is providing a, a firm foundation to our compliance journey. It's saying, you know, we, we are stored in a FedRAMP compliant cloud uh, and, and it's encrypted through to through. Prevail, I, I like to kind of look at this as like building a house, right? Uh, if AWS is the foundation, Prevail is putting up the studs. They're, they're putting in the plumbing, they're doing the electric. When you throw it all into comply up, you've added drywall. You know, you've added drywall and you've finished the drywall. And you said, look, now we have a house. We're starting to build a house here. Uh, but you still have 26 requirements to get through and you want someone to button it up. You got to send it home. You really need someone to look at the extra requirements and say, okay, I can get you from this score of 40 that Prevail has helped get us to, all the way to 110. And that's where, you know, you need someone to come into that house and give us some paint, you know, put some furniture down, a good trim job. Uh, and that professional painter that we have here today is Reagan Means. And he's, he's going to talk to you about how he can help get you to that full 110. So uh, I appreciate uh, the time. And I, with that, I'm going to pass it off to you, Reagan. So thank you. I, I'll uh, you know uh, appreciate uh, the the presentation. Uh, very folksy as well. Um, hopefully uh, easy to to digest. But I think the important points that um, Matt made are number one: started with the foundation of AWS GovCloud, built a system to store and share CUI in there, a simple system by which you can organize the critical aspect for compliance, which is your documentation and your SPRS scores. And finally, you've got yourself a very robust baseline in a compliance program, but you still need an expert to stitch it all together. There are aspects of compliance that you know, AWS and Prevail shoulder part of the responsibility for, you still have to fulfill your part. And oftentimes, again, you can slog through it yourself, but the best thing that we recommend over here is to get an expert and to guide you through some of those aspects of it uh, and, and uh, how the program is put together such that you're truly ready for an assessment uh, over to Reagan Evans. Thanks, Sanjeev. Um, what we'll do is I will show you a single slide that I've got here and we'll um, take that away. Let's see. <clears throat> So the path to compliance, folks. Now, you know, as Sanjeev and AWS, um, um, uh, amazing, um, uh, really contributors to the CMMC ecosystem and comply up, have really talked about is the fact that they are critical enablers, right? By no means whatsoever, for which they've emphasized, uh, is this, you know, one and done. There is a lot of work, folks, that has to get done as you use these critical enablers across both your IT infrastructure um, and those of that are connected to the systems that connect to Prevail, and of course, uh, uh, to your business process, which manages um, CUI and really in the workflow. And most organizations actually create far more CUI than they actually receive in the process and, and the performance of a contract. So, with that, we want to have clarity about the fact of really how do I get there, right? So I you I have these critical tools. I've got great authoritative uh, direction and guidance on how to execute the requirements, and then how do I manage this relationship in these tools and really get there? So you know, in this in this scenario, which is you know pretty generic, we've got you know the DoD relationship with a prime and their prime contractors relationship to subcontractors, and sometimes those primes are big, sometimes those primes are really small. And those subcontractors may have multi, 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 multi-tier relationships with lots of different folks in execution of the contract. Sometimes a higher tier organization may have five or six subcontractors that they actually use 
um, even though they may be tier three or tier four or tier five or tier, tier six or tier seven. So that relationship is not diluted. That relationship is required to meet requirements wherever the CUI or FCI is fl uh, flows or is created. Now, that, that's an important piece. So it's not limited to the systems that we're talking about, which really provide you the foundation, which is in your organization, but throughout your organization, if they're connected, logically connected to them. And also those organizations, of course, uh, um, outside your organization, external to your organization, such as um, uh, those that provide cloud services might be also connected depending upon your configuration and of course, um, external, external suppliers. With that, we always want to remember when we're implementing these requirements and following the guidance that Prevail has uh, with their excellent documentation and, of course, um, uh, the AWS providing the, the really the substantial backbone for how Prevail helps you meet these requirements, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that those requirements are implemented correctly, and if they're not implemented correctly, it doesn't really matter how, how vital and, um, and critical they are to enabling you you have to really implement those requirements and do them correctly. You also have to ensure that those um, those uh, uh, requirements or those controls are implemented and operating as intended. Okay. If we look to the CMMC assessment guide, in if you look to one of the controls, it talks about security assessments, and that really is the function and the foundation for a CMMC assessment. And so it has three criteria. It, the controls are implemented correctly, they're operating as intended, and they're producing the desired result. That's the reason why the documentation is so important. When you've implemented, you have to demonstrate the fact that these that the implemented controls are doing what they what you say that they're doing or what they're supposed to be doing. So um, as you um, as you implement the controls and those controls begin to work with you every single day, they rely on a backbone of policies and detailed procedures which describe how you govern and how you manage these controls and which describe how your organization executes their procedures every single day and what they do. So if I'm an engineer and I'm developing CUI by doing um, engineering drawings related to the performance of the contract, and, I'm, and me and my engineering team of, of another guy um, are working and producing these diagrams, I have to have a detailed procedure which discusses and describes how we do that and how we manage the CUI working with uh, Prevail or any other solution that you have integrated within your environment. So when we, when, as we're doing these things, these, these policies and procedures are built on a situational awareness that we actually create when we're doing our risk and our security assessment, which are two separate requirements, but we often combine them into sort of a um, single one we call a RSA or risk and security assessment. Those requirements really look at more than gaps. They're really talking about um, what you're doing right and what you're not doing and identifying those gaps, of course, but developing the plan to get you where you need to go. And that's how, in, in this instance, that's how ComplyUp supports those requirements is because it helps you manage um, your understanding of what you need to do and, and how long is it going to take you, who's involved, and then managing those requirements throughout the documentation process. Now, remember that as you implement those requirements on your plan of action milestones, they have to be implemented correctly. And again, you have to create um, evidence that they are operating as intended and they're producing the desired outcome. Now, as we do that, as we do that, that sort of walk down that road that I discussed, we're creating all of this information to go in our system security plan. And that is the ultimate document, but it's certainly not the only document. So you're going to have a risk assessment and a security assessment, or you can combine them. You're going to have policies, and you're going to have procedures, and you're going to have many other um, docu documented artifacts or uh, assessment um, objects is what they're, what they're called in, in the standard. And these assessment objects meet all sorts of evidentiary requirements to explain how we're doing this, what we're doing it, how often we do it, and so on and so forth. When we talk about the system security plan, it encapsulates all of those details to describe how my organization meets each and every single control. And for some of those controls, you're going to receive documentation from, from people like Prevail, and they're going to show you, we do this part, and that's our responsibility, and then now you do your part, and this is your responsibility. And then you describe, you take their documentation and describe how you fulfill your portion of your responsibilities and then overall, how you meet the requirements. As you, as you document that, that system security plan, folks, this is not going to be a 50-page document. It's not going to be a 100-page document. 
is likely to be very, very long. Sometimes in some organizations, it's three or 400 pages. Now, you may freak out a little bit, but remember that don't, uh, don't be overwhelmed because if I describe something in a page and a half of text about how we do this, and I spend a, a, a bit amount of time in detail and 110 requirements, that's easily 100 pages. So if I spend two, uh, two pages in that talking about this, that could easily be well over 200 pages. So you know, depending upon the size of your organization and complexity, um, it, it, it may be a very lengthy document, but that's just to prepare you for the level of detail that's expected by the government and by the c 3 PAO. Remember that as we accumulate this documentation, and it's detailed for sure, I don't, I, I don't want anyone to have any presupposition that a one or two sentences is going to be uh, sufficient. It will not be sufficient, folks. Okay, I spent my, the, the, the greater part of more than the greater part, probably 75% of the last three years of my life, navigating these requirements uh, to, to get a, a very crisp and clear understanding of what's expected by the government. Okay, so when we develop these documents, we're going to do them in a way that we're going to continuously monitor how we meet these requirements. Doesn't matter if we can do it through an automated re, uh, method or whether we do it through a manual method. You know, we're just, we're just, um, hey, you know, uh, Sanjeev, I want to meet today and I want to discuss about access control and let's talk about this and let's go through our procedures and, and talk about, make sure that they're up to date and, and have any questions with you and make and make sure we we um, modify any changes. Reagan, so those uh, things, uh, yes, sir. Sir, we are two minutes oh, short. I'm sorry. So uh, we should wrap up uh, sure. and uh, I want to give some just a 30 second concluding remark. So I know. Sure. Um, so what, I, what, what I'll just wrap up with this and sorry, I get carried away because, uh, you know, uh, this is this is what I do, folks. Um, remember that the checklist and the auditing are really important to this. And so and, and so um, a mechanisms like comply up and other tools provide you a means, a very useful means of managing these requirements and executing these requirements. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sanjeev, and thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, I really appreciate your your thoughtful comments, Reagan. And I think that hopefully uh, to the audience, you have seen the journey of what it takes to go through the compliance you know, process over here. You know, together with AWS platform, systems like Prevail and ComplyUp, we can get you to a very strong foundation. But I want to underscore that you know, you'll need compliance expertise to stitch it all together. At Prevail, we have built a strong partner ecosystem, Reagan being a lead amongst our, our partners, so that should your organization say, hey, look, I'm going with this with the system, I need compliance expertise, you know, we'd be glad to, you know, put you in touch with compliance experts that understand the system and can efficiently and cost effectively, you know, put the system together for you, such that when the time comes, uh, for an assessment or an external audit, you can do so confidently. So with that, I'd like to thank the participants and, and uh, the audience uh, for your time. Um, we will be sending out an email update to you um, with a recording of this session, as well as contact information for folks. Um, if you have any questions on compliance or wish to have any follow-ups, uh, there'll be ample opportunity to do, to do so. So again, thanks very much on this exciting journey that we're all on together. Uh, it can be a pain, but hopefully we have shown you a path to kind of uh, minimize the pain uh, to a substantive level for you. Um, have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sanjeev. Thanks, Sanjeev.